Good evening. Is this working? Yes. Okay. I'm told I can't touch the uh, microphone. Bad things will have happened in the past when I've done that. Uh, anyway, welcome to the uh, eighth annual Hazlett uh, Women in Leadership uh, Forum. I'm, I'm pleased to see so many familiar faces here, as, as well as a number of uh, new faces. I'm Phil Cochran. I'm director of the Randall L. Tobias Center for Leadership Excellence. I'm also the executive associate dean Indianapolis for Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. Let me just quickly uh, uh, mention that you should have picked up question cards when you came in. If not, they'll, they'll be handed out a little bit later. But at the end of the talk, if, if, if you could write down any questions you have, and then we'll have some Q&A, depending on how much time we have left. This forum is uh, sponsored by the uh, Randall L. Tobias Center for Leadership Excellence, the IUPUI Chancellor's Office, and the IUPUI Office for Women. I'd like to begin by recognizing Ambassador Randall L. Tobias, who's here with us tonight. Without his uh, generous support uh, and great interest in leadership uh, studies, uh, we would not be here tonight. Uh, and again, thank you, Ambassador Tobias. Uh, Ambassador Tobias was uh, recently named a trustee of Indiana University as well. And I'd also like to recognize another trustee who is here, uh, Janice Farlow. There you are. Can you stand up? <laughs> Uh, she's the uh, student member of the IU uh, Board of Trustees and uh, is, an, is an MD and a PhD student uh, here at the IU School of Medicine. Now, I'd like to say just a few words about what we do at the Tobias Center. The Tobias Center was founded with a gift of five and a quarter million dollars to Indiana University by the Randall L. Tobias Foundation. The purpose of this gift was to create the Randall L. Tobias Center for Leadership Excellence to study and, expire, and, and inspire excellence in leadership. The center is a university-wide entity that's housed here on the IUPUI campus and was officially inaugurated in 2004. The center and its programs are collaboration of four Indiana University schools, the Kelly School of Business, the School of Education, the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, and our brand new school, the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. The Tobias Center is a source, collaborator, and convener on the subject of effective leadership. We're committed to the practical application of scholarly research and cutting edge leadership practice. We bring together the best knowledge and practice from all sectors, including the worlds of corporate, community, education, government, religion, medicine, social service, and other nonprofit leadership. We have 22 faculty fellows around Indiana University who do research on leadership, teach classes in leadership, and provide support for graduate students who uh, work in the area of leadership. Our Hoosier Fellows Program is our signature program at the Tobias Center. It's designed to enhance the already demonstrated leadership skills of a small group of high-level leaders. These leaders come from a variety of different sectors, including business, government, hospitals, foundations, private and public schools, churches, and other nonprofit organizations. They learn from leading practitioners and scholars in the field of leadership. They learn from each other, problem solving over the course of a year. The fellows study both the elements and the context of leadership through monthly meetings and a year-long program. They travel to different venues to experience 24 hours of immersion in leadership studies in contexts as diverse as military leadership, which we study at the Muscatatuck Urban Training Center. We look at religious leadership at the Benedictine uh, uh, leaders at, at the Benedictine St. Minor at Arch Abbey. We look at implementing change and team building in uh, Bradford Woods, and achieving maximum team performance through a a real race car pit stop exercise on pit row at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's always very exciting. 
Uh, each spring, we host a, a, a three-day conference to explore the latest leadership research and problem-solving techniques. We also host a series of leadership lectures, including this one. We're gathered here tonight for the annual Hazlett Women in Leadership Forum. This forum is named after Susie Hazlett. I'm pleased to welcome members of the Hazlett family who are here with us tonight. Uh, husband Bruce, Mother Wilma Chance, daughter Laura, and at least four or five others. If you could stand. <laughs> Susie was many things. Uh, I particularly enjoyed the fact that she was born in Seattle, as was I. Uh, shortly after her birth, her family returned to Rushville, Indiana, where she uh, grew up. In a state where state fairs are very important, Susie was the queen of the 1962 Indiana State Fair. She had degrees from Hanover College and Indiana University. She was the president of the Children's Museum Guild and recipient of the Guild's coveted Spooner Award. Susie helped develop the Rush County Community Foundation and served as its first director. She served as the executive director of the Lawrence Township Education Foundation and was a member of the Hanover College Board of Trustees. She was a marketing director for Trinity Homes, an independent consultant for nonprofit organizations providing strategic planning and fundraising services. Under her outstanding leadership, the Literacy for Life program was created for public and private schools statewide. She was the executive director of the Randall L. Tobias Foundation, which granted the funds to create this center. With IUPUI Chancellor Jerry Bebko and me, Susie established a framework that created the Tobias Center. After she so suddenly passed away from ovarian cancer, Ambassador Tobias suggested that the Tobias Center establish a, a lecture series in her name, and we were very pleased to do that. Uh, next, I would like to, uh, in about one minute, uh, talk about Lori Burns McRobbie, the First Lady of Indiana University. She was unable to be here tonight, but she, uh, she sends us a video presentation. So if we could have that next. Good evening. I'm Lori Burns McRobbie, First Lady of Indiana University and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2013 Hazlett Women in Leadership Forum, a yearly program of the Tobias Center for Leadership Excellence here in Indianapolis. I regret that I can't be with you in person tonight, but fortunately, with the help of the fine video technicians at IU, I can bring greetings virtually. The Hazlett Forum recognizes excellence in women's leadership through showcasing the many outstanding examples of what women are doing throughout the state of Indiana and beyond. As we're all acutely aware, we are in an age where leaders in every sector are challenged by problems of daunting complexity and often global impact, and where trust in public and private institutions alike is on the decline. This is why the work that the Tobias Center does is so vital to the future of the state of Indiana, our nation, and indeed our world. It's also why we gather here tonight to remember Susie Hazlett, who exemplified courage and vision in all that she did to inspire men and women alike to become leaders who can make a difference. Susie Hazlett was a role model for so many during her lifetime, and she continues to be now. Role models matter because it is through seeing leadership in action that we learn about our own potential for leading change and gain insight into the motivations and values of others and ourselves. But perhaps even more important is that we see diversity among our role models. The more we hear from both women and men, as well as from those who represent minority groups, different professions and communities of interest, and other cultures, the more we understand how progress occurs and how each one of us, acting in the interests of others, can help transform our communities for the better. Our keynote speaker tonight is a wonderful example of leadership in action, and I especially regret not being in Indianapolis in person tonight to hear my friend Ora Peskovitz speak. Ora exemplifies excellence in her chosen profession of medicine, 
in her leadership of Riley Children's Hospital in Indy, and now at the University of Michigan's extensive medical research and clinical operations, in her support of the arts, and in her dedication to ensuring that the people around her, her colleagues, her patients, her wonderful children, are able to achieve their goals and make progress in addressing the many issues in our world today. Tonight, on behalf of IU and my husband, Michael, I want to extend special greetings to Aura and to congratulate the Hazlett Forum and the DeBias Center for their steadfast and critically important advocacy for equity and excellence in leadership at all levels. Welcome to tonight's forum. And now I'm honored to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Ora Peskovitz. As many of you know, from her years here in Indianapolis on our campus at the Indiana University School of Medicine. She served the School of Medicine from 2000 until she left for uh, Michigan. From here, we, she oversaw a dramatic growth in the research at Indiana University School of Medicine and excellence in children's healthcare at Riley Children's Hospital. During that time, the school's research enterprise nearly doubled in size, from $133 million to nearly $260 million per year in grants and contracts. She also oversaw the construction of 700,000 square feet of new research space for the School of Medicine since 2003. Ora began her work at Indiana University as the Executive Associate Dean of Research Affairs for the School of Medicine. In this position, she administered the Indiana Genomics Initiative, which was funded with $155 million in grants from the Lilly Endowment. This organization laid the foundation for the next generation of IU research, building on the discoveries of the Human Genome Project and helped jumpstart the state's life sciences economic development efforts. Ora also contributed to the creation of Indiana University Clinical and Translational Science Institute, a statewide collaboration of university scientists, businesses, and government to translate the discoveries of basic science into improved health care for patients. Among her numerous accomplishments, she served on several early BioCrossroad task forces, the Initial Selection Support Committee for the Indianapolis Zoo Prize, the Dean's Advisory Board of the Heron School of Art, the Board of the Bourne's Jewish Studies Center at Indiana University, the Board of the Congregation of Beth El Zadak, the Board of the Clarion North Hospital, and Central Indiana United Way Board. In 2004, she was named President and CEO of Riley Children's Hospital while continuing her work in the School of Medicine. As the leader of the nation's sixth largest pediatric hospital, she oversaw the expansion of Riley services across the state, as well as the construction of the $470 million, 675,000 square foot Simon Family Tower. She added another leadership role when IU President Michael McRobbie appointed her as Interim Vice President of Research Administration, tasking her with restructuring the management of research for all of Indiana University's campuses. In 2009, Ora Peskovitz became the University of Michigan's first female Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs and Health Systems CEO. In that role, she oversees $3.2 million billion dollars in revenue and $490 million in research funding and is responsible for the leadership and management of the UM hospitals and healthcare centers, the UM Medical School, the clinical services of the UM School of Nursing and the Michigan uh, Health Corporation. Or is nationally recognized as a pediatric endocrinologist and researcher who has published over 184 papers and books and was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2011. Most of her work has been on physiologic and molecular mechanisms responsible for disorders of growth and puberty with a focus on the development of novel therapies for those conditions. She has received numerous awards for her research, teaching, and leadership. A small sample of them includes 25 women who make a difference from the Michigan Women's Foundation, the Northwestern Alumni 
Association Merit Award, the Distinguished Leadership Award, Michigan Business and Professional Association, the 2011 Robert H. Williams Distinguished Leadership Award, the Endocrine Society, uh, and Crane's uh, Detroit Business 2010 Newsmakers of the Year. She was elected as one of the 50 hospital and healthcare women leaders by Becker's Health Review. Or served as the president of the Society for Pediatric Research, the nation's largest pediatric research organization, president of the Lawson Wilkins Pediatric Endocrine Society, chair of the March of Dimes Grants Review Committee, a member of the Board of Directors, the Hormone Foundation, the National Association of Children's Hospitals and Related Institution, the Children's Miracle Mile Network Hospitals. She's currently on the boards of the Association of Academic Centers and Arbor Spark and Life Technologies. I could go on for another half an hour, but at this point, I would like to ask Aura to come up here and give her talk. Well, well, to tell you the truth, I don't really think I have to give my talk because I think you gave it already. <laughs> So thank you so very much, Phil. I'm really um, so incredibly appreciative of that extraordinarily generous introduction. Um, there was really no need for that. Um, and like I said, there's no reason for my talk anymore. Um, so thank you um, so very much. I really would like to uh, acknowledge Ambassador Tobias for, um, first of all, for creating the Tobias Center, because um, I think it's really a wonderful center, and uh, it's doing tremendous work. Um, thank you for everything you've done uh, for Indianapolis. Um, I'm delighted that we're neighbors um, and friends um, and uh, so thank you for everything that you do and uh, to the Hazlett uh, family um, thank you for everything that you have done as well uh, I have to say that it's um, really a tremendous uh, honor and a privilege uh, to be here uh, to uh, speak in honor of um, your uh, your lovely uh, loved one um, and I have to say uh, how much this means to me and although um, uh, First Lady McRobbie is not here, uh, I did know that she was going to do this video, but only uh, just a couple days ago, because I happened to see her in um, the football suite uh, at Michigan on Saturday, and that's when she told me that uh, she wasn't going to be here. I didn't actually know that she was planning to be here, but she mentioned that she was going to make this video, so I happened to see President and First Lady McRobbie, and I, uh, I thank her for that very generous uh, introduction. So I'm delighted uh, to be here uh, to speak at the Hazlett Women in Leadership Forum, and I hope that this is ready. Um, let me go back one. Um, because uh, although I didn't know uh, Susie Hazlett, I'm certain that she and I would have been wonderful friends. From what I've learned about her, and you spoke so beautifully about her, Phil, I understand that she was an incredible woman. She was obviously a loving wife, a wonderful mother, and a great citizen here in Indianapolis. I know that she and I shared a love of children, both our own children and others' children as well. I know that she was passionate about education and that she had a great passion for education here at IUPUI and that she loved her work here at IUPUI as did I. And I know that she cared uh, deeply about others and that she uh, was indeed a great uh, leader. And that's what we are here to talk about today, which is uh, women in leadership. And so I know that it is indeed uh, my loss that her life was cut too short by a terrible illness. And we who work in, uh, in medicine are working hard to uh, make cures for diseases like ovarian cancer. And I hope that one day uh, others who suffer from this disease uh, will uh, be saved and will not have to endure what she unfortunately endured. The invitation to first come to speak here today came from Chancellor Charles Bantz, and I understand that he is actually tonight off with his lovely wife, uh, Sandra, who's speaking in California. And so I share this picture um, of um, 
uh, Chancellor Bantz and uh, his uh, lovely wife Sandra, with my uh, late husband Mark and me, and because I think it's a wonderful a reminder of a wonderful time that we had at a very important Indianapolis celebration. And this was at the opening of the Conrad Hotel, our first five-star hotel here in Indianapolis. And uh, this is a number of years ago. And that celebration uh, was actually held in honor of Riley Hospital. And all of the proceeds from that event uh, went to uh, open um, the Conrad, but went to honor Riley Hospital. And it was at the time that I first uh, became the CEO of the hospital. And so it was a very wonderful time. And uh, I show the picture to remind me of our friendship, um, the work that we did together, and uh, to celebrate Riley Hospital as well. So I've been asked to talk about my personal path and what I've learned about leadership. And I decided to tell you a little bit about what I've learned about life as well. Um, but you've already heard about my entire path, so I don't really have to tell you very much about that. But I feel a little bit um, uncomfortable telling you um, about my own path in leadership because in this room, I see so many people who, frankly, have achieved so much more than I did, uh, starting, frankly, um, with Susie Hazlett. But so many um, other people that I see here in this room today uh, could really give this talk and frankly have achieved so much more than I have achieved. So my goal for today, frankly, would be that each of you might come away with maybe just one little tidbit, and I hope maybe there will be one little thing that each of you might take home from some of the lessons that I have learned um, throughout my now not so short life. Um, so I hope to uh, share with you some of the things that I've learned. And that was my assignment, by the way. So um, I don't want to come across as arrogant, but it was the assignment that Charles gave me. He then went off to California. Um, so, um, I was asked to tell you about my path, and I decided not to start with my conception, although um, if I go as long as you did, um, <laughs> it would be pretty long. So um, instead, I'm going to start actually, uh, instead of starting at my conception, I'm going to start in ninth grade. Um, and I'm not going to keep you here all night, but the reason I'm going to start in ninth grade is because ninth grade for me was actually an important uh, turning point in my life. Now I'll tell you why it was important. Um, you already heard that I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. So pediatric endocrinologists um, are very interested in different phases in life. And my particular specialty area was puberty. And so I like ninth grade because it's an important time in puberty. And and for me, especially ninth grade was important because I took a class that was called research and development. So development was an important thing, but it was especially important for me because I was the only girl in this class. And I really liked that fact that I was the only girl in the class um, because it was really fun to be the only girl in the class. But the other reason that I really liked this class is because it turned out to be a fork in the road in my personal development. So up until that point in my life, um, starting from the time that I was about six years old, I had been playing the piano uh, quite seriously. And in fact, I thought that I might go on to a career as a classical pianist. Um, my mother was a pretty strict mother, and I had been playing the piano pretty seriously. And I thought that I was probably going to play the piano uh, professionally. But in ninth grade, I took this class called Research and Development. And the class was quite interesting. The class required that you design a, an experiment, and that you uh, develop a hypothesis, and that the experiment tests the hypothesis, and then you determine whether or not the hypothesis is correct. Well, this was the 60s, the late 60s. And I was interested in music, as you already heard. And so I decided to test the hypothesis that if you played music to plants, that they would grow. I wanted to know, would they grow? So my experiment was to have three groups of plants. A group that you played no music to, that was the control group. And a group that you played classical music to, and a group that you played uh, Beatles music to, rock music. So I had three groups of plants. A group that got no music, the control group. A group that got Beethoven music, and a group that got well over Beethoven. Okay. 
So that was my experiment. Now, I bet you want to know what happened. Well, here's what happened. None of the plants grew. <laughs> because I wasn't very good at growing plants, and I'm still not. I'm not going to be a gardener. Um, and here's what I learned, that it was terrible to grow these plants, but I was fascinated by the idea that one could design a hypothesis to test and answer a question. It was fascinating to me. And so I concluded that I loved science. It was such an amazing thing to me that one could ask and answer a question that could test a hypothesis. It was just amazing to me. But I also learned that I wasn't really interested in testing questions about plants. And I wondered whether one could do the same thing about questions about people. And was it possible that one could ask questions about people? And as it happened, I grew up in Bethesda. I noticed that in those slides that they were showing in the preview, they actually showed a, a slide of me in Bethesda, Maryland. That's where I grew up. That was in the backyard of the National Institutes of Health. And I was allowed to then go and do experiments shadowing scientists, real scientists, at the National Institutes of Health. And these scientists were actually asking questions that tested hypotheses in people. And so I realized that one could actually become a scientist that asked questions about human health. And you could actually test questions that might address questions about humans that might allow us to gain advances about human health that might one day lead to cures like cures for ovarian cancer. And that led me to challenge whether I might actually want to be a pianist. And instead, and I didn't know the term at the time, but I thought that maybe I would want to become a physician scientist. And so that led me down the path towards thinking about going to medical school. And in fact, shortly after graduating high school, I ended up enrolling in a six-year medical program, which was college and medical school. And so um, I went into medical school at 18, and um, five and a half years later, I graduated from medical school with a, a MD and a husband. Um, and <laughs> and uh, many of you um, here um, know, um, knew my husband, Mark. And uh, together, he was a year ahead of me in the same program, a six-year medical program. Um, the two of us uh, actually went off uh, to pursue our respective careers. Mark went on to a career in surgery and then to pursue a career in transplantation. So he became a transplant surgeon. And I went on to pursue a career in in pediatrics and pediatric endocrinology and then all those things that you talked about. Um, but uh, here's a look at us, um, a, peek at, a peek at us, um, from our time at the National Institutes of Health. We actually went back to the National Institutes of Health together. And uh, this is an important picture. And I show it to you for a reason, because um, we were doing research at the time. Mark was doing a fellowship at the National Institutes of Health, where he was actually studying pig immunology. And, um, I was doing my pediatric endocrinology training, and I know I look fat there, but the point of this picture is to say that we were doing more than just <laughs> research. Um, and, <laughs> um, and this was in um, late 1983, and the product of what we were doing in there happens to be sitting in the front row here um, today. Um, and <laughs> And, I, um, and part of the reason for showing this is to say that life is about more than work. Um, and um, so I do want to make that point about balance. And uh, I also want to make the point here that this picture was taken at a baby shower. And this was a very progressive place, the National Institutes of Health, because this baby shower, you might assume, was being held for me. But actually, this baby shower was being held for Mark. And they invited me to come. And that's why I was in a hurry. Um, and I, that's why I was wearing the white coat, I was seeing patients, I was doing an experiment, and I rushed in for this picture. But he was relaxed because Mark was just there having the party. And um, the baby shower was for him, and I was in a hurry, and I just happened to bump in there for a few minutes. Um, so he looked very, very relaxed, and he was at ease, and he was having a good old time. That, of course, is in contrast to this picture. 
three and a half years later, where he doesn't look so relaxed because <laughs> three and a half years later, um, he's half asleep because the work-life balance thing wasn't working out so well for him. Um, <laughs> By now, he had two jobs. Um, he was <laughs> working day and night as a transplant surgeon, and um, three kids later, three kids and three and a half years later, uh, we were really juggling on the work-life balance thing, and um, it was a real challenge. Um, having said that, I would say that it was all very much worthwhile. But you can see that he was trying very hard um, to keep his eyes open, read books to the three children, and hold them all in his lap. But he did, he did manage to juggle this quite successfully, I will admit. So uh, during this time, we made four professional moves. And um, one of the challenges, of course, in um, juggling work-life balance, and you have a dual career, is, of course, figuring out who takes, whose career takes priority and precedence. And this is a very big challenge. And we did manage somehow to figure this out, but not without um, some um, some tension in our marriage at various times during our marriage, and I think that it's something to acknowledge and um, deal with. We did um, manage to deal with it. And of course, um, the most exciting time, you happened to mention 1990, um, but the reality is that the big year for us was actually 1988. And that was the year um, that uh, was probably one of the most stressful years in our marriage. And that was the year that, for me, I discovered that we were moving to India, no place. Um, and um, for me, that's really what it was. Because at that particular time, um, I uh, had really never heard of Indianapolis. I didn't know where it was on the map. I had to pull out a map when Mark said, you know, I really, really, really want to come here. Um, and it was at a time when Mark was being offered a great position here in the Department of Surgery. And for me, there really was no option. And I mention this because um, it is a, a lesson in uh, what one has to do if one is juggling and balancing a career with what you saw in the last picture, three little children. And uh, it is an important thing. But as you also heard from the very generous introduction that Phil gave me, um, it did turn out to be quite OK. Um, because um, all the wonderful things that happened to me here at Indiana University School of Medicine and Riley Hospital, which I'm not going to repeat because you said it all already, um, it turned out to be, um, for us, the best uh, years of our lives, both professionally and personally. Because so many spectacular things have happened um, to us as individuals. But more importantly, I have to say, and I see so many of you here um, that were so critical to uh, me personally during that time. And I'm just looking out um, to see you here in the audience. Um, I have to say that I take so much pride and joy in your individual accomplishments for what you did. And I see my successors here uh, in the audience, a number of you. Um, and I just want to tell you that um, you know, I, I'm bursting with pride. I think about the IU School of Medicine and Riley Hospital as my fourth and fifth children. Um, and I just want to tell you how much it means to me to see uh, the successes that continue uh, to take place here um, under your stewardship. And so um, I'm, I feel great privileged that you've invited me home again. Um, but in 2009, um, I did leave uh, to go to the University of Michigan. And it was a sacrifice, personally, to give up both research and patient care. But I traded that um, for uh, the opportunity to watch uh, an extraordinary health system and to lead an extraordinary health system go on uh, to try to lead the nation in health care, health care reform, biomedical innovation, and uh, medical education. And that's really what I do today. So I've been asked to talk about what I believe are some of the elements of successful leadership. And so in my remaining time, uh, what I'd like to do is to try to talk to you about what I believe those important and necessary elements are. And so I'm going to go through uh, some of these. And so I believe that to be a successful leader, one needs to have goals. And they should not be just ordinary goals. I believe that they need to be aspirational goals. And it's not sufficient to just have aspirational goals, but once you have those goals and they are aspirational, then you need to have a plan to pursue those goals. Having said that, once you have aspirational goals, 
you can't necessarily stick to your goals that you originally had. You, you have to be flexible and adaptable. And of course, I've already mentioned this, but balance is essential. And that's not enough, too, because without somebody to help guide you and mentor you, you will not achieve your own successes. Everybody needs a mentor, and I believe that successful leaders are happy leaders. So I'm going to go through now a little bit of time on each of these points and tell you why I believe that each of these is exceedingly important. So let me take a few minutes now and use myself as an example by telling you what I mean by achieving goals. And I'll just use my own goals at different stages in my life and tell you what I think about these. So 40 years ago, I had goals. And I'll tell you what they were. I had my first goal was to have six kids. I loved kids. I told you that. I wanted to have six of them. I was very serious about the piano. Even though I was going to medical school, I still wanted to play the piano. And I expected that I would play the piano semi-professionally, even though I was going to play the piano. Uh, even though I was going to go to medical school, I was still going to play the piano. But in order to do that, I knew that I would have to practice medicine part-time. So those were, that's what I thought my life would look like. I'd have a whole bunch of kids around me. I'd play the piano part-time, and I'd practice medicine part-time. And that's what I thought my life would look like. And I'd have a husband because I thought I'd have to have a husband to have those six kids. <laughs> uh, and I thought he'd support us while we had this, that, that kind of a lifestyle. So what is the reality of my life today? It doesn't look anything like that. Uh, I only got three kids. I, my husband pooped out. Uh, <laughs> I don't touch the piano. We do have a piano, but it's out of tune. And you know what? I don't work part time. And uh, <laughs> when you describe what I did when I left here, I had three full time jobs. I don't know if any of you happen to remember, but there was a front page article in the Indianapolis Star. When I, I see some of you nodding, but when I left, there was a front page article in the Indianapolis Star that said I would be replaced by three full time people. Um, so, um, and my job in Michigan isn't part time either. So I don't work part time. But I do still have goals, so you might want to know what they are today. Um, I'm probably not going to achieve these goals either, but here are my goals today. So I'll give you three goals from today. By the way, I have no say in this first one. So I, have, I want my three kids, to be, who are now adults, to be successful, happy children, um, child. Um, <laughs> but of course, I have no control over this one. Uh, my second goal is that the University of Michigan Health System, which I am responsible for, I would like it to become a national leader in healthcare. I do have some say over this, but probably less control than anybody really thinks. And my third goal, I'm glad that we're among friends here because this is sort of a secret goal. Um, you know, I'd like to write a book. And by the way, not the book that you got out there, because the book that you got out there was written by Mickey Maurer. And um, I do want to say that um, that book that you got out there talks about 19 stars. I'm not one of those stars. I see that Judge Barker's here. She's a star. She's in that book. Um, she deserves to be in that book. I don't deserve to be in that book. But um, Judge Barker does deserve to be in that book. So I'm not talking about writing that kind of a book. I have a secret desire to write a secret book that um, I'll probably write anonymously. So anyway. <laughs> but that's my secret goal. OK, but what do I think about goals? So um, here's what I think about goals. And I see Pam Perry here, and she knows well what I think about goals, because I've talked with her about this for about 15 years. So my thought about goals is that one should have aspirational goals. And I saw that you had a quote up there from me, um, and it was similar to what I'm going to tell you now. So because um, I guess I haven't changed my mind about this for a long time. So. Uh, I like to quote Robert Browning, who said that a man's reach should always exceed his grasp for what is heaven for. And I really do believe that people should aspire for something that they can't necessarily achieve, um, and that they should reach for the stars with their goals, because they don't necessarily have to reach them. You know, because sometimes, when you think about a goal which is um, almost implausible, almost improbable, but you have a plan 
to achieve that goal. And you go about working hard to execute on that plan. Before you know it, what seems initially implausible all of a sudden seems less improbable. And if you keep at it, then it seems almost possible. And then before you know it, it suddenly seems possible. And sometimes it becomes inevitable. And you're doing it, and you're achieving it. But even if you fail, if you have reached for the stars, you know what? You might just land on the moon. And that is so much closer than someone who hasn't aspired for anything at all. And so I really do believe that people should have aspirational goals. And you know what? If you miss, and it's possible, you'll miss. So what? Because it's still important that you be adaptable and flexible. And I really do believe that this guy, Charles Darwin, had it right. He said, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent who will survive, but those who best manage change. So if you aim high and you miss, but you're adaptable and you're flexible and you manage change, I think you will adjust. And I use myself as an example on this. I did not want to come to Indianapolis in 1988. It was not my first choice. It wasn't even on my list of choices. I had about 10 choices, and Indianapolis wasn't even on the list of choices. And yet, it really was the absolute best possible thing that could have happened to me personally, to Mark, and to our family. And so I use it as a great example of what happens when you are flexible and adaptable and make the most of a situation that may not have been what you had originally hoped for. And at the same time, I think finding balance in your life is something that is of the utmost importance. And so that balance between what you do in your personal life and your professional life, what you do in your in aspects of your professional life is of the utmost importance too. People often ask me, you know, how did you balance being a scientist and a clinician? How did you balance being an administrator and a mother? How did you balance all these different things? Well, the truth of the matter is I don't actually remember how I balanced being a mother and all those things during most of those years. I actually don't really know how I did balance all those things, just like these people. I don't think they know how they're balancing their either, but somehow you do. I will say one thing though for working parents, because I, I remember during the many years that my children were growing up, the one thing that I can say that I think is of the utmost importance if you have children at home, is that you must take whatever resources you have to ensure that you have the best child care arrangements for your children, because I know that I could never focus on my work when I was worried about my children's well-being. So there were years where I spent more money on my children's childcare than I was earning. There were many years like that. Um, and so if you have to take time off work to take care of your children, or you choose to take time off work to take care of your children, either spouse, or you have to spend more money than you're earning to do that, you need to do that. Um, that I know was absolutely true. But there are other ways that you need to find balance in your life, what, whether that is by finding something that you enjoy or something that you want to pursue. It is important to live, love, learn, and laugh. And that is what I very much believe is a principle of finding balance in your life. I believe in that very, very strongly. So the next key point that I believe is critical to successful leaders is mentorship. Nobody ever got to become a successful leader by just waking up one day and being a leader. And I think about where I had gotten most of my mentorship, and I have to say that for me, it certainly started from my childhood with my parents and my brothers and my friends and others. And I developed uh, quite a while ago a principle that I'm going to share with you now that I call a mentorship quilt concept. And this concept came to me actually in a negative way um, because uh, I had a very beloved mentor who uh, disappointed me. 
And this is a mentor who was maybe my most favorite mentor. By the way, I have to remind people that and this is a women's leadership forum, um, but I did grow up in my professional life in an era where there were not many women who could serve as professional mentors to me. So I wasn't um, at in an era where there were no women mentors, but there were very few for me. So most of my mentors were men. And that was fine with me. I didn't really have a problem with that. But my most favorite mentor was a man who I adored. And I adored him for um, many, many reasons. He was a man who always encouraged me to pursue any project anywhere. And to this day, um, I uh, have an attitude about research and science and investigation and discovery, which comes from the things that he taught me. But he uh, disappointed me in his personal life um, because uh, he, he was promiscuous in his personal life. And it was disappointing to me because I um, had put him on such a pedestal. And when I discovered this about him, I wondered whether he could still be a scientific and a professional mentor to me. And it really shook my whole thinking process about mentorship. And so as I struggled with that and wondered, wow, am I going to have to throw him out as a mentor and find another mentor? I developed this concept that I'm going to share with you now. And this concept that I've developed is what I call the mentorship quilt idea. And I love this idea now. And I've, I've kept it with me ever since then. And this was um, early on in my uh, training that I came up with this notion. Um, and the idea is this, that you can keep mentors for all kinds of reasons, and you really should. And so um, this is how I think about mentorship today, that I can have a mentor quilt, and I can have a mentor for everything that I need, and more than one for different categories. So that mentor to me is still a mentor to me for, oh, I'm sorry, that mentor is not a personal mentor to me, but I can have a mentor to me who can serve me for personal reasons, can give me advice on personal matters. That mentor to me is a professional mentor. He advises me on scientific matters. I can have a mentor who can advise me on financial matters, and another mentor who can advise me on business matters, or relationship matters, or child care matters, or service matters, or ethical matters. And all together, I can create an entire quilt of mentors. And each time I meet someone new who can serve me as a mentor, I add another patch to my quilt. And what I love about this concept is that it's warm, it's comforting, I keep adding another patch to my mentor quilt. And I never discard anyone, because even if I don't like everything about that mentor, I can discard that part of what I don't like, but I keep the parts that I like. And whenever I need comfort or warmth or mentorship, I wrap myself up in my mentor quilt. And I use what I need, and it helps me to advance in whatever part of my life I happen to need at that moment. But I keep that mentorship quilt with me, and it helps me to advance. And it's worked very well for me. And I keep getting older and older, but I keep needing that mentorship quilt as I advance in my career. And it's worked exceedingly well for me. So what are my thoughts about happiness? So I look around, and I see these incredibly successful leaders around me. And I think, well, is it really true what I said that all successful leaders are happy? Well, you know, I've challenged myself on this a lot. I go back and forth on this. Certainly, not all successful leaders are happy all the time, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute. But I do believe that all successful leaders are happy when they are most successful. And that I still believe to be true. They're not always happy, that's for sure. But when they are most successful, they are happy. But here are my thoughts about happiness and success. So I do think if you look carefully at successful leaders, they are happy. But happiness is not to be equated with satisfaction. Now, you know, a lot of people might mix these words up and say they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. So what's the difference between happiness and satisfaction? And I really like to distinguish these two things. So here's the problem with being satisfied with something. If you're satisfied, then you're content. 
And here's the problem with being content. If you're content, then you're complacent. And if you're complacent, then you are satisfied with mediocrity. And if you are satisfied with mediocrity, then you are not going to aspire or reach for the stars or want your organization to do something extraordinary. And that is why, as a successful leader, you cannot ever be content. So when somebody comes to me and shows me their great project, what they've done, I will tell them, I'm very happy with what you've done, but I'm not satisfied. <laughs> and they don't usually like what I say, but it is usually what I say. I usually say something like, this is really great. Now what are we going to do? Because I'm never totally content. Because I always want our organization to move to the next step. I usually give it a few minutes before I say that. And some of you have worked for me. I know there are a lot of people here who know this about me. In fact, um, is Erica still here? Um, I don't Oh, yeah, she's here, because she made a whole skit on this. Um, <laughs> they, they roasted me once, and they made a whole skit about this. Um, so I think we have it on, on video. Um, yeah, we have it on video, actually, because they, they made fun of me with this very principle. Because I believe in this as a way to motivate organizations to move further and higher and faster. And um, I do think, <laughs> what was it, be productive. Yeah, we did a skit on being productive. Because because um, I do think that you have to keep moving higher and faster. And that's the problem with mediocrity. But it's not, it's not the same as not being happy. You can be happy with the organization's success and people's success, but you can still not equate it with being satisfied. And so it's a fine distinction, but I think it's important to distinguish. And I don't think that it is um, a demoralizing thing to tell people that we still want more. And so I think it's possible as leaders to communicate that we're happy with the progress, but we still want more. It's possible to be able to communicate both of these things at the same time. But it's a difficult and a tricky balance to do that. Now, as an individual, what happens if you reach a place in your life where you are not happy? Because I did say that every person, and certainly every leader too, does reach a place in their life where they are not happy. I mean, it happens. It happens to every person at some time in their life where they will not be happy. It's going to happen. So I have a little rule that um, I have had to follow myself, um, where you get to some point where you dis discover that you're not happy. So if this happens to you, and it will, but what's Bora's rule on what you should do? So the first, it's called the 4P rule. So the first rule is that you should press or push or lobby for a change. So there actually is somebody in this room that this happened to with me. and. Um, and that person actually pressed and pushed and lobbied for a change. And I'll give you an example of something um, that I can remember now that happened like this. So um, if you happen to need something to make you happier in your workspace, like let's say you need a window to make you happier to work, and if a window in your office would help you be happier in your workspace, you should ask for it. Because if that one thing would make you more productive in your work, you should lobby for that, press for that, push for that. Because if that one thing is possible to change your environment, and you'll be happy and more productive, your boss would be happier too. And you should push for change. And if it works, that's great. I pushed Mark really hard to not go to Indianapolis. I really, really did. I said, let's go to San Francisco, let's go to Chicago, let's go to New York, let's go to Washington, let's go anywhere but Indianapolis. It didn't work. So I, I had to go to the next P. Okay, so the next P is put up with it and accept that change and live with it. What that really means is instead of changing the circumstance, which is what the first P is, change yourself. In other words, you still have to be happy because you will not be successful if you're unhappy. You have to get happy with the circumstance. So in that case, what you have to do is change yourself. And that's what I did. I said, I lost. 
he won, I lost, I'm going to have to change, and I'm going to have to get happy. And I did. And so I changed my attitude, and I got happy. But, you know, sometimes, after you try to change, and you do your best to change, you still can't get happy. And so then you have to say, well, what are you going to do now? And then you have to decide that the first P doesn't work, you pushed and tried. The second P doesn't work, you tried to put up with it. What are you going to do now? And sometimes this does happen. It happens professionally. This is what happens in divorces. You do try very hard. You hope that you've gone to counseling or you've gotten a coach if it's a professional situation. But if neither of these two P's work, you do have to go to the third P. And that is you have to pull out and leave. And that is the case because you cannot be successful as an individual or as a leader if you are unhappy. So you must change the circumstance. You just cannot live in an unhappy circumstance. You've got to change. And then finally, regardless of where you are in this cycle, you have to play. You have to live in a happy space. And so those are the four P's. So um, I'm going to now um, tell you in general where I got all these thoughts and uh, ideas about leadership. And you heard already um, that I've been a scientist. I've been a physician and I've been a mother. So what have I learned from these different roles? Well, as a scientist, I've learned to design experiments and analyze them and think critically. So that's where some of these thoughts come from. As a physician, I have uh, gained compassion and also uh, thought about collecting data and using the data that I've used uh, from laboratory studies to then learn to act decisively. And as a mother, I have tried very hard to create an environment in which my children would receive the necessary resources in which I would hope that they would thrive and um, exceed my own personal achievements and um, reach their maximum potential. And those are the places where I've learned what I've learned about leadership. So I know that some of you before have heard me talk about how I've applied these principles that I've uh, gained to what I've called before the seven C's. Um, I've now actually added um, an eighth C. Um, and I've done this actually since Mark died. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the seven C's and the eighth C that I've added um, since Mark died. And so the first C that I talk about doesn't really start with a C, it starts with an M, and it's the moral compass. And these are the things that I think, when you think about them together, all together, are the qualities and characteristics that truly extraordinary leaders possess and that distinguish the extraordinary from the ordinary leaders, these eight things. So what do I mean by moral compass? So I think that the moral compass is knowing right from wrong and knowing who you are and where you're going. And if you're a religious person, this might be your sense of religion. If you aren't particularly religious, it is your sense of conscience. It might be your North Star. It's your sense of knowing where you are going. It might be your goals, it's your path, but it is your moral sense of direction, and I do think that it is what drives you. Uh, the second C I've alluded to already, but it is a sense of compassion, and I believe that this is critical for people who um, have great leadership. And it is the ability and the capacity to feel empathy. It's knowing that you're not alone in the world and that it's very likely that no matter how difficult it is for you, someone else has it worse than you. And even when you have experienced uh, trauma, pain, or suffering, there is someone who has had something harder than you, and you're able to put yourself in another person's shoes and try to experience what it is that they feel. 
this is the C that I've added uh, since some of you have heard me talk about uh, these Cs before. And I have to say that um, before Mark died, I had been thinking about courage um, as an important C um, for people that are truly extraordinary. But I hadn't thought about how important it was. But I have actually added it now. Um, and there are a few reasons why I now think that it's really critical. Because um, courage means being unafraid to fail or to be wrong. And I do think that true courage is actually displayed always, not just in the face of adversity. And so, um, Benny, I know that you're here, and I actually put this slide in. I thought you would be here. I didn't know for sure. But I actually put this slide in for you. Um, and so this is a picture of Mark um, from the days when he uh, did pig immunology. It's actually an old picture, but I put it in for Benny uh, because Benny uh, worked with Mark in pig immunology research. It's a picture of him from uh, the time at the NIH. But um, Mark was a man who actually displayed uh, tremendous courage throughout much of his life. Um, but I actually um, show it uh, largely uh, as a reminder of our family um, and the tremendous resilience and courage that my children have displayed uh, in the face of Mark's sudden death a little less than three years ago. Um, and um, he, Mark was, as you, many of you know, uh, a man of, of extraordinary gifts and talents, um, not only in his work and his research, um, but his sudden death uh, required our family to display extraordinary courage as well. Um, I know there are some people here from Heron, and um, I thought I would share with you um, a picture that Mark was going to use um, for a postcard for a photography exhibit that Mark was hoping to have at Heron for his next show, which he has not had, but I'm hoping that we might have it posthumously one day. This might be a little offensive to some of you, um, but those of you that know Mark's sense of humor, um, uh, he wasn't just a surgeon. Um, you know that he had a great sense of humor, and um, he was a photographer. So his show was going to be called Shocking. Um, and um, you can see here, um, he had gone all around the world taking photos of electricity. And this was a photo of him in front of a Van de Graaff generator that he had taken. My daughter's closing her eyes, so I'll get rid of it quickly. Um, <laughs> Um, but anyway, that, he was going to have that show at Heron here, so um, we'll have it here. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to talk to Valerie and make sure that we have that show here. It's a wonderful show, actually. We have all the photos, um, so it's a terrific show. Um, the next C is contribution, and extraordinary leaders um, make important contributions, and contribution really is uh, doing work that is important and ultimately benefits others. And Anne Frank uh, said in her diary, isn't it wonderful that no one need wait but a single moment before starting to make the world a better place? You know, it's kind of unfortunate, of course, that she died at the age of 16. So her ability to actually make the world a better place on her own, she wasn't able to go on and do things, and yet her diary went, clearly went on to make the world a better place. I share this picture, um, oops, there it is, um, of Mark um, doing the first kidney transplants in Kenya. Um, as another example, actually, of somebody making a contribution. And although I won't be able to be here tomorrow, I know that tomorrow night is the Kenya Gala, and uh, the IU School of Medicine is a terrific example of um, a university uh, and an entity that is clearly making an extraordinary contribution in the world um, by the work that it is doing. Uh, I don't know how many times, but I certainly know when I was last here, uh, they were up, up one of five uh, nominees for a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Peace Prize, for this extraordinary contribution in the world. 
not this specifically, but the contribution that um, the AMPATH program is making in Kenya. So this is a prime example. Um, I did include also this picture, um, but this is Mark um, yet becoming a village elder um, for the work that he was doing um, to create um, that first uh, kidney transplant program. I do have to say that that sheep was not alive um, by the evening. Um, it did become the evening meal. Um, and it was a part of a feast that they made. Uh, so. Um, now, the next C is commitment, because it's not enough to just talk about making a contribution and wanting to make a contribution, but frankly, um, it's about the hard work that you do to achieve your goals, because it's about the due diligence and the time and the effort and the energy. All these people who just do the talking, it's not enough. But these are the people that actually have the commitment and do the work um, to achieve their goals. And the next C is communication. And communication is critical to everything we do and every interaction we have. Because if you, as a leader, do not articulate your ideas, how successful will you be in actually executing on your vision? And then I talk about collaboration, because we can't do things alone in isolation. Most things in life are improved by having the perspective of others. So great leaders don't sit alone. They work collaboratively with others. And then finally, what I believe is in some ways maybe the most important quality of truly successful leaders. And this is, if you pick just one that really distinguishes extraordinary from ordinary, I do think you have to have all of these eight C's together. But I really think that creativity is uh, the most, most important uh, quality of all. Um, uh, let me go back uh, to, sh to show you that. Um, because um, Einstein said that imagination is more important than intelligence, and I believe that too, because creative people look at the same things that everybody else sees, but they see something different. Um, and the creativity is not just limited to artists or poets or writers, but creativity is there in administrators and businessmen and lawyers and doctors. Um, and creativity really is a quality that enables uh, extraordinary leaders to do extraordinary things. And so I really think that it is a truly unique quality. So I thought I would end um, with an example of um, application of these eight Cs. And I don't know if this video that I have here is going to work. Um, I'll tell you uh, what the story is. We'll try the video. And if it doesn't work, then I'll describe what this is. So this is an application of uh, the eight Cs in a child. And I don't know if Rich Miyamoto is still here. I can't see very well. There's a, well, there's Rich. OK. Um, so this, I told you about the story a little bit outside. So this is a baby uh, at the University of Michigan, a child who has uh, an, a very rare disorder, um, a tracheobronchomalacia, an abnormality. Um, and um, due to some extraordinary and creative work um, that I hope will show up in the video that uses all of these eight Cs, uh, this child's life was saved. So let me see if the video works, and then I won't have to tell you about it. It's better in the video. Let's see. He was six weeks old when we were at a restaurant for dinner one night when he stopped breathing and turned blue on us. He spent 10 days in the hospital then, came home. Uh, two days later, he ended up getting turning blue again, stopped breathing on us, and played every night, just hoping that he would pull through. Quite a few of the doctors said that he had a good chance of not leaving the hospital alive. It was the most devastating thing that a parent could ever hear. At that point, I think it was real desperate. Anything that would work to make him live would we pretty much would take it and run with it. No other doctor knew how to do anything about it, so luckily Dr. Green came up and was able to do something. Tracheal malacia is collapse of the wind pipe that makes it so a child is unable to breathe out. It's fairly rare, about 1 in 2200 children has tracheal malacia. Kaiba is one of those children that had severe tracheal malacia. 
even with the, the best medical treatments were, that are available, he continued to have breathing difficulties and continued to have events where he was unable to breathe. We obtained imaging of his defect with the CT scan. Scott Hollister instantly and rapidly went about designing a splint that could go and meet this, this need. This is the first time this procedure has been done anywhere in the world. This is a model of Kaiba's trachea and bronchi. The splint is designed to slip over the top of the bronchus just like this. This is really the first time I think it's been used uh, on an emergency basis where there's no other treatment available. So we get the plastic, the biopolymer, in a powder form with a very small particle size. We also have a, a computer file uh, that contains the information we've designed into the device, essentially the geometry of the device, etc. So it's a, it's a biopolymer, essentially a, a plastic that's biocompatible and you can use it in the body and it, it absorbs over time. Kaibo was brought to the operating room. The splint was placed over the top of the bronchus. This has a process of opening the bronchus up anteriorly and posteriorly to completely widen the bronchus. It was amazing. As soon as the splint was put in, the lungs started going up and down for the first time. We knew that he would be okay. It means, it means the world to me just knowing that something actually worked and was able to save our son's life, it just means everything to me. We better get told. We can tell the people the story. So all it's all going to be is a story about his life. How he made it, how he's doing, and how far he's going to go. I just thought that that was a nice example of how you could bring together, you know, compassion and commitment and compass and, um, and creativity. And so I just thought I would end with that great story. But I really want to end by thanking all of you for inviting me back home. Um, it was really wonderful to see so many dear friends and colleagues again. And I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be here. So thank you so much. Well, this concludes a, a wonderful evening. Uh, we want to thank you all for coming and Aura for her inspiring remarks. As a token of our appreciation, Aura, I want to present with, to you a gift from the Tobias Center. This is a brass sextant, a uh, means of finding your uh, true north. Okay, thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, Carol Madison and Jean Plunkett for uh, putting together this wonderful evening and for working through all the uh, technical glitches that we had for the hour or two before we got this started. Uh, we wrestled with this presentation as Laura suggested, but it all worked out wonderfully. If you haven't done so, uh, please feel free to visit the ovarian cancer uh, uh, table outside, the National Center for Excellence in Women's Health, the Julian Center, the Center for Wellness uh, for Urban Women, and the Coleman Breast Cancer Awareness Display table looking outside. And again, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful evening. <laughs>